Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is 5 p.m. I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is the April 20th, 2021 Rainbow District School Board regular board meeting. Please be advised that this meeting is being live streamed and will be archived. The Rainbow District School Board would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabeg, including Atikamishing, Anishinaabeg, and Wanapate nations. We would like to acknowledge that we are situated within the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 and want to recognize the inherent rights of the Anishinaabeg that maintained these lands from time immemorial. We'll begin the meeting with a roll call. Director Blazik. Thank you, Madam Chair. Trustee Dabosky. Present. Trustee St. Jean. Present. Trustee Gibson. Present. Trustee Cosmerly. Present. Trustee Morrison. Present. Trustee Dewar. Present. Trustee Honda. Present. Trustee Stringer. Present. Trust, trustee Le Clement. Present. Student Trustee La France. Present. All here. Thank you very much, Director Blazik. Approval of agenda motion that the agenda for the regular board meeting of April 20th, 2021 be approved. Moved by Trustee Morrison, seconded by Trustee Cosmerly. Poll vote, Director Blazik. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Honda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried. Motion is carried. Preliminary declarations of pecuniary interest. See none. There are no presentations. Report from the in-camera committee of the whole meeting of the board, Director Blazik. We have two motions. motions. Motion that the board, yes. sorry. Motion that the board ratify the tentative local agreement between the Rainbow District School Board and the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, OPSU, Local 614 Educational Assistance and Communicative Disorder Assistance as recommended by the Labor Relations Committee. Moved by Trustee Morrison, seconded by Trustee Hunda. Poll vote, Director Blazik. Oh, excuse me. Um, recognize uh, Trustee Morrison. Very brief comment before you take the vote, Madam Chair. It's just on behalf of the Labor Relations Committee, I again want to thank our, our lead negotiators who were our HR manager, Tiffany Hayes, and our superintendent, Bruce Bourget. They've had various staff members supporting them through various rounds of negotiations, but they are our lead negotiators. And with the two motions that we are considering tonight, Rainbow Board would have reached a, a negotiated settlement with all of our represented employee, all of our employee groups who are represented by federations or unions. This is a huge accomplishment. So thank you again on behalf of the Labor Relations Committee to, to Bruce and Tiffany for their hard work to bring all of these agreements to a successful conclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, Trustee Morrison. And thank you to the team that has worked so hard to bring us to this point. Director Blazik, poll vote. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Honda. 
In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried unanimous. Second motion, that the board ratify the tentative local agreement between the Rainbow District School Board and the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation Professional Student Services Personnel, known as PSSP, bargaining unit of District 3, as recommended by the Labor Relations Committee. No, Mike, Chair Dewar. Sorry, moved by Trustee Morrison, seconded by Trustee Stringer. Questions, comments? Call the vote, poll vote, Director Blazek. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Honda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried unanimous. Thank you very much. Old business previous minutes motion that the minutes of the regular board meeting held on Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021 be approved. Moved by Trustee St. Jean, seconded by Trustee Cosmerly. Poll vote, Director Blazek. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Honda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried unanimous. Motion is carried. Thank you very much, Director Blazek. Old business, previous minutes. Motion that the minutes of the, did we just do this? No. That the minutes of the regular board meeting held on Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021 be approved. Moved by Trustee Morrison, seconded by Trustee Hunda. Madam Chair, I just wanna clarify, it's March 30th you're referring to? Oh, sorry, okay. Okay, I'm sorry, that's what I needed. I appreciate. I thought I had the, I thought I had the wrong one. I will re, re a check on that, that it is Tuesday, March the 30th, and it's the special board meeting held on Tuesday, March 30th. Same mover, same seconder, any questions? Who were the movers and seconder, uh, Madam, Ch Madam Chair? Pardon? The mover was again? The, the mover was uh, Trustee Morrison and the seconder was Trustee Hunda. Thank you. Yeah, and poll vote, Director Blazek. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Hunda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried unanimous. Thank you very much. The motion is carried. Aren't these Google Meets wonderful things to <laughs> conduct meetings by? Please forgive me. Uh, 2020 
2021 school year update. I'll call on Director Blazik. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, um, we have um, a robust report coming forward, so bear with me. Um, trustees, I appreciate this opportunity to provide another update on the 2020-2021 school year, which will go down in history as the most atypical school year ever. In our ongoing response to COVID-19, our staff, students, and families have shown a tremendous amount of resilience. Resilience is often described as an ability to bounce back from challenges or to go with the flow in the face of change. We have been living and learning in this pandemic for over a year now, and I continue to be proud of our staff, students, and families that have responded both personally and professionally. Their adaptability and flexibility over an extended period of time has been admirable. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank them for working together to keep everyone safe. Health and safety, as always, remains our first and foremost priority. We begin our update tonight where we left off, in the gray zone. Just to recap, on March 11, 2021, the province of Ontario activated the emergency break in our local health unit region to interrupt the transmission of COVID-19 and contain community spread. Confirmed cases had increased significantly as a result of the highly contagious variants of concern. Public health subway and districts moved to the gray lockdown zone on Friday, March 12, 2021 at 12.01 a.m. In-person learning shifted to remote, remote learning on Monday, March 15th and continues until further notice. As of Monday, March 22nd, we have some students with significant needs in our school board who are being accommodated in person with ongoing health and safety protocols. Decisions are made on an individual student basis and reviewed regularly. The accommodations are very specific and very limited given the current context with the pandemic. As March rolled around, we immersed ourselves into staffing and planning for the 2021-2022 school year. We look to the Ministry of Education for guidance on what we can expect for September 2021. Will school boards be designated like they were last year? If so, will the designations be the same this year? Will there be a requirement for boards to offer remote learning? Will there be any change to the synchronous minute requirement in PPM 164? What will the requirements be for cohorting? In other words, will this fall look like last fall? To date, we have yet to receive a response to these questions. As a result, we are staffing and planning for a normal school year. We will make any necessary adjustments when we receive more guidance from the Ministry of Education. And while we recognize that this is not an ideal way to proceed, we are required to meet our staffing timelines in accordance with our collective agreements. So we cannot take a wait and see attitude. After we receive ministry guidance, we will gauge the interest of our families for in-person versus remote learning as required. If we survey six months ahead of time, the data may not be as accurate as it needs to be for decision-making purposes. Superintendent Bridget, our manager of human resources and our school administrators may, once again, have to be flexible and adaptable as we receive more information from the Ministry of Education regarding expectations for the 2021-2022 school year. On March 24th, we received an invitation to participate in a Ministry of Education pilot project to provide wireless internet connectivity to select students without access to better connectivity options. Manitowani, Massey, and Minamoyo were identified as areas of interest. These areas include Asiganak Public School, S. Geiger Public School, and Central Manitoulin Public School. There will be no cost to school boards and student households for this pilot, which includes a one-time initial investment and service costs for a minimum of six months. Prior to the end of the pilot, the ministry said, we will jointly determine the path to a viable operational approach. Naturally, I was quick to say yes, we will participate in the pilot. 
wanting our communities to benefit from improved connectivity. Equity of access remains a priority within our board. What I did not know at the time was the province's long-term plan for remote learning in Ontario. On March 24, 21, a headline in the Globe Mail caught our attention. Ontario considers move to make remote learning permanent for all boards going forward. The article stated that the Ontario government is considering legislation that would make remote learning a permanent part of the public school system, according to a confidential ministry document. It went on to say that if introduced and passed beginning in September 2021, parents would continue to have the ability to enroll their child in full-time synchronous remote learning if they choose going forward. The document stated school boards would also be required to provide students with remote learning on snow days and in the event of an emergency that results in a school closure. The ministry document stated that school boards would choose to operate separate virtual schools, but there would be no additional administrative funding from the government. If implemented, the document stated, this change will help ensure students have continuous access to public education, even when they cannot attend a physical school. Another item in the news that caught my attention was that staff who serve students with special needs in Niagara, in the Niagara area, were being vaccinated. That prompted us to reach out to the local public health unit for similar consideration, which yielded positive results. Public Health Submarine District worked directly with school board partners and daycare operators to identify individuals within their organizations who met eligibility criteria to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Staff members who serve special, popu or serve special populations and provide health services or direct patient care to students with special needs or developmental services or mental health and of course addictions were all eligible for COVID-19 vaccine. These individuals included early childhood educators, educational assistants, and teachers, as long as they provided direct client services to students who require high levels of physical care and where physical distancing is very challenging or masking is not possible. We extended an invitation to eligible staff to register for vaccination clinics through public health. Eligible staff were primarily educational assistants, and teachers who work with students who have exceptional needs in intensive support classrooms located in a number of schools, including Jean Hansen Public School. This marked an important turning point for us in the pandemic as the employee group was the first to be offered the vaccine. We are grateful to public health submarine districts for working with us to make this happen. On Monday, March 25th, 2021, we confirmed with Public Health Submarine District that remote learning will continue until further notice. We sent a letter to our families indicating that there will be no in-person learning until such time as Public Health Submarine District advises us that we may resume face-to-face -face instruction. Of course, we reminded families of the importance of following health and safety protocols to limit the spread at home and in the community, particularly in light of the variants, which are highly transmissible. On Friday, March 26, Chair Dewar called a special board meeting. And on Tuesday, March 30th at 6 p.m. to discuss the provincial proposal for online and remote learning. Chair Dewar invited the director, superintendents, and federation leaders to share their perspectives at the meeting. A news release was issued on Monday, March 29th to inform the public. Given the significance and the scope of the topic, the meeting was live streamed. Even though schools were closed for in-person learning, public health submarine districts continued to manage and follow up on confirmed cases and contacts of school-aged individuals. Directors asked public health if the shift to remote learning was having the desired outcome. Public health indicated that it was encouraging to note an overall downward trend in school-aged cases, and they shared some statistics. They indicated that this is good news and hopefully the trend will continue and provide ongoing evidence of the effectiveness of the shift to virtual learning. Of importance, however, is that the numbers remain high both in this age group and in the community overall. The current surge would be expected to negatively impact on the feasibility of in-person learning at this time. The special board meeting was held on Tuesday, March 30th from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. 
Close to 150 people logged on to the live stream, evident that the topic had broad interest in the communities that we served. Trustees, senior admin, and federation leaders are united in their belief that in-person learning, where students come together with their peers and their teachers in a traditional school setting, provides the optimum, the optimum environment for children and youth to develop physically, socially, emotionally, and cognitively. Trustees unanimously approved the following motion, that the Rainbow District School Board write a letter expressing its grave concerns that the provincial government's proposed plan for online and remote learning. At the close of the discussion, Chair Dewar indicated, our in-person public health education system is the great equalizer. It is the level playing field that, that provides an equal opportunity for all our children, regardless of race, color, or creed, and regardless of geography, income, or capabilities. This is an issue worth fighting for. I think we can all agree with that assessment. On March 31st, as we were heading into the Easter weekend, we advised parents and guardians that, once again, Public Health Subarine District had confirmed that remote learning will continue until further notice. We indicated that we will share information with families as soon as the current situation changes. On Thursday, April 1st, as the number of COVID-19 cases continued to surge across Ontario, Premier Doug Ford announced a province-wide lockdown for at least four weeks. The rest of the province joined us in the gray zone, effective Saturday, April 3rd. Ontario's key indicators in the latest modeling show that additional measures must be taken to limit the spread. From March 26th to 28th, provincial case rates increased by 7.7% to 101.1 cases per 100,000 people. These increases are being driven by COVID-19 variants, which are transmitted easily and result in a higher risk of death and hospitalization, including in younger populations. Of note in this lockdown is that non-essential businesses are allowed to remain open with very limited capacity. Unlike the previous lockdowns, you could go to the mall if you chose to do so. From Thursday, March 25th to Wednesday, March 31st, there were 156 new cases and 18 active outbreaks. 43 new cases tested positive for COVID-19 variant of concern, which is 28% of the cases reported in this period. At the end of day, March 31st, there were 316 active cases and a total of 1,439 local cases since the pandemic began. 413 screen positive for a COVID-19 variant of concern. On April 6th, Health Canada, Health Canada issued an advisory regarding the purchase and use of face masks that contain nanoform graphene, flagging emerging risks and cautioning the use of these masks in healthcare networks, schools and daycares. The Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, sometimes known as MGCS, confirmed with their suppliers that no masks in the government's pandemic inventory at any point contain nanoform graphene. The masks in our schools come from MGCS inventory. Our health and safety officer advised principals that there was no cause for concern with the masks in their schools. On April 6th, it was indicated to us that given the local health units are being given greater discretion on vaccinations within the regions, directors may want to consult with their local health units to see if education staff can be prioritized for vaccinations. This prompted us to follow up with our coterminous boards and public health. The Ministry of Health, or sorry, the Ministry of Education rather, confirmed that education workers are included in phase two, but that all plans depend on consistent supply of vaccines. Exactly one week after it had pulled the emergency break provincially, the Ontario government determined the stricter measures were needed. On Wednesday, April 7th, Premier Doug Ford declared a third of provincial emergency in response to the rapid increase in COVID-19 transmission, the threat on the province's hospital system capacity, and of course, the increasing risk posed to the public by COVID-19 variants. The COVID-19 situation is at a critical stage and we must act quickly and decisively to stay ahead of these deadly new virants, said Premier Ford. By imposing these strict new measures, we will keep people safe while allowing our vaccination program to reach more people. Effective Thursday, April 8th, the government issued a province-wide stay-at-home order 
requiring everyone to remain at home except for essential purposes, such as going to the grocery store or the pharmacy or accessing healthcare services, including getting vaccinated, or for going outdoor exercise, or for work that cannot be done remotely. Non-essential businesses were now required to close and shift to curbside pickup. Big box stores and grocery stores are no longer able to sell non-essential goods. Keeping schools and childcare open is critical to the mental health and well-being of Ontario children and youth. Schools and childcare will remain open for in-person care and learning in public health region where it is permitted, with strict safety measures in place. Rainbow schools remain closed to students as directed by public health submarine districts. The situation locally is very serious, and I'm supportive of the stronger measures being put in place by the province, said Dr. Penny Sutcliffe, Medical Officer of Health with Public Health Submarine District. Almost 55% of recent cases have screened positive for variants of concern, known as VOCs. And we are seeing the virus spread in many locations, including workplaces, daycares, and social settings. Under the current restrictions, it is illegal to gather indoors with people not from your household. I cannot stress how important it is to follow public health measures to buy ourselves time as we continue to work to get vaccines into arms, added Dr. Sutcliffe. To help the community understand where the outbreaks are, are occurring, public health began to post information about all outbreaks on its website when there are no personal privacy concerns related to that situation. With this expanded disclosure of COVID-19 outbreaks, public health will begin posting details of outbreaks in settings like workplaces, post-secondary institutions, and licensed childcare centers. This information is in addition to the details already posted related to outbreaks in schools and institutional settings, such as long-term care homes, retirement homes, hospitals, and congregate living settings. The information is updated as outbreaks are declared or declared over. As the clock turned to April 8th, the stay-at-home order and new restrictions took effect. The status of schools across Ontario did not change. Local health units make decisions regarding the ability of schools to offer in-person learning. From Thursday, April 1st to Wednesday, April 7th, there were 164 new cases and 20 active outbreaks. 60 new cases tested positive for COVID-19 variant of concern which is 37% of the cases reported in this period. At the end of April 7th, there were 243 active cases and a total of 1,600 local cases since the pandemic began. 457 screened positive for the COVID-19 variant of concern. On April 9th, the Ministry of Education issued a memo regarding the vaccination rollout for education staff. Beginning the week of April 12th to 16th, the spring break, Eligible education staff would be able to register for vaccination appointments. This includes education staff who provide direct in-person support to students with special needs across Ontario. Education staff who provide direct support to students with special needs are defined as those who support students who meet one or more of the following criteria. Who requires support with activities of daily living, including health and safety measures. Are unable to wear a mask for medical reasons have complex medical needs, or cannot be accommodated through remote learning. School boards were asked to provide a letter to eligible employees as soon as possible. After consulting with public health suburban districts, we sent a letter to education staff on April 9, 2021. We indicated that public health suburban district had advised Rainbow District School Board that education staff supporting students with special education needs in Rainbow Schools are now eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. This includes staff working in various roles at the Center for Education and in schools in Sudbury, Espanola, and Manitoulin Island. Education staff who provide direct supports to students with special needs are defined as those who support students who meet one or more of the following criteria. Who require support with activities of daily living, including health and safety measures are unable to wear masks for medical reasons, have complex medical needs, and cannot be accommodated through remote learning. Vaccines are safe. They're effective and the best way to protect you and others from the vaccine, or from the virus rather. We shared a vaccine resource from public health. We encouraged staff to book their appointments as soon as possible and provided the contact information. 
We indicated to staff that they would be asked, excuse me, we've indicated to staff that they would be asked identifying questions such as the school board or school where they worked. They would also be asked if they met the criteria. Employees were required to bring a letter from the school board and proof of employment, such as a pay stub, to the vaccine appointment to confirm eligibility. We extend our appreciation to public health suburban districts for making this opportunity available to staff who work with our students with special needs. As the largest school board in Northern Ontario, Rainbow District School Board offers the most comprehensive special education services and programs in the communities that we serve. The first round of vaccine offerings in March included approximately 230 staff eligible according to the criteria outlined by public health. The second round in April included approximately 300 staff eligible according to the criteria outlined by public health. Therefore, a total of approximately 530 staff in Rainbow Schools met the eligibility criteria. This number includes a small group of temporary and casual educational assistants who work in various schools on a regular basis with students with complex special needs. We do not track how many employees choose to be vaccinated. Anecdotally, we know that many employees made appointments and have since received their first dose. On Monday, April 12th, staff at Cecil Facer and Frank Flowers had an opportunity to be vaccinated. The vaccine has, was being offered to residents, staff, essential caregivers of high-risk congregate settings. Our staff were able to book an appointment for the clinic at Carmichael Arena. The letter on remote learning was sent to the Ministry of Education on behalf of the board on April 9th. It was shared across Ontario. Also on April 9th, leading up to the spring break, we sent a reminder to staff and students that remote learning will resume on Monday, April the 19th and, con and continue until further notice. We indicated that at this time, we are not sure when Rainbow Schools will reopen for in-person learning. After Public Health Suburban Districts advises us that we may resume face-to-face -face instruction, we will survey parents and guardians to determine who may wish to transfer between in-person and remote learning for the remainder of the school year. We advised our staff and families to please continue to follow all health and safety protocols to limit the spread of COVID-19, including hand washing, physical distancing, mask wearing, and staying home. Socialize with your own household and refrain from traveling. Screen from symptoms daily using the COVID-19 school and child care screening tool, and please get tested if you are sick. The health and safety protocols are more important than ever with the highly contagious variants of the virus that are circulating in our community and across the province and beyond. We wish our families and a, health, a healthy spring break and thank them for working together to keep everyone safe. Meanwhile, the Ministry of, Ed of Education sent a templated letter for school boards to share indicating that schools would remain, would, sorry, would reopen after the spring break with stricter health and safety protocols, including the need to confirm that elementary school children had completed the school screening tool. Staff were also required to deliver health and safety reminders to students. Given our local context, with schools closed to students until further notice, we did not send this letter to our families. We did, however, include the guidance to socialize within your own household and refrain from tra traveling in the letter to parents and guardians that I just mentioned. We also took an interest in the educator guide on a healthy and safe return to school that accompanied the templated letter. Once we received the go-ahead to resume in-person learning, this guide will provide an excellent resource for our teachers to deliver a health and safety refresher for students. The ministry has also developed a short video clip sharing a health and safety reminder for when in-person learning resumes. The video is available on supports for learning virtually, supports for virtual learning rather, at eCommunity on the ministry's virtual learning environment, often referred to as the VLE. Shortly after the templated letter was sent to us, Premier Doug Ford announced that all elementary and secondary schools in Ontario would be learning remotely following the April break. The decision was made in response to the rapid increase in COVID-19 cases, the increasing risk to pose that posed to the public by COVID-19 variants, and the massive spike in hospital admissions. We are seeing a rapidly deteriorating situation with a record number of COVID cases and hospital admissions threatening to overwhelm our healthcare system, said Premier Ford. He added, 
By keeping kids home longer after the spring break, we will limit community trans transmission, take pressure off our hospitals, and allow more time to roll out our COVID-19 vaccine plan. Childcare for non-school age children will remain open, before and after school programs will be closed, and free emergency childcare for the school age children of eligible healthcare and frontline workers will be provided. On April 14th, the governments of Canada and Ontario announced $656.5 million in funding to provide critical infrastructure upgrades to protect students and staff from COVID-19 in Ontario schools. You will recall that Superintendent Bazinet provided an update on ventilation and other projects in our schools at the Strategic, Strategic Planning Committee meeting held on February the 2nd. Rainbow District School Board was provided $8.2 million in COVID-19 resilience infrastructure funding. Here is a summary of the projects being completed in Rainbow Schools. From Thursday, April 8th to Wednesday, April 14th, there were 173 new cases and 17 active outbreaks. 100 new cases tested positive for a COVID-19 variant of concern, which is 60% of the cases reported in this period. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, April 14th, there were 215 active cases and a total of 1,773 local cases since the pandemic began. A total of 595 have screened positive for COVID-19 variant of concern. Let's now watch our local medical officer of health, Dr. Penny Sutcliffe, put these numbers into perspective. Hello, my name is Dr. Penny Sutcliffe and I'm the medical officer of health with Public Health Sudbury and Districts. I wanted to share a few words about COVID-19 and the vaccine. I realize that it might feel a little bit dark right now and my hope certainly is that it is darkest before the dawn and the dawn that we're heading into uh, with the end of this pandemic uh, is really thanks to the work of so many people and the COVID-19 vaccine and getting doses into arms. Over 50,000 people in our catchment area have already received their first dose, so we are well on our way, uh, but we're not protected yet, and we all need to keep up with those public health measures that you have been practicing over this past over a year now. We have seen an uptick in cases. We are certainly well into our third wave, um, and we're also seeing very concerningly a high percentage of these cases being the variants of concern, those are the mutations of the virus that are more transmissible and that we are learning, in fact, can cause more severe disease and in younger age groups. We're also learning more about the long-term effects of COVID-19 infections, people who are having health effects well past the time that they are infectious and this leading to concerns for themselves and certainly for the healthcare system also. So all the more reason for us to do whatever we can to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The weather's getting nicer so we can be outdoors, which is a safer place to be for the spread of this, uh, of this virus. Uh, but we do need to make sure that indoors we are only gathering with people who are within our same household under our same roof. We cannot be gathering indoors. It's too risky right now with those who are not in our household. This is the spring break for many and a well-deserved break for our educators and for our kids. In most of the Sudbury District area, schools have gone to virtual as of the 15th of March. We know that this will continue for some time after the uh, break uh, with the recent provincial announcements. My goal is to get kids and educators back in face-to-face -face learning as quickly as we can, but we will only do so when it is safe to do so. Thank you all for your ongoing work. We will get through this and public health Sudbury districts will do whatever we can, whatever it takes to support you, your families and our community as we get through this pandemic together. Thank you. Dr. Sutcliffe summarized her message to the community as follows. Like last week's provincial wide stay at home order, the Ontario government's decision to move elementary and secondary schools to remote learning following the April break signals the severity of circumstances across the province. In most of our service area, schools already moved to virtual learning as of March 15th. Our goal is to resume face-to-face -face learning as quickly as possible, but we will only do so when it is safe to do so. She continued, the COVID-19 situation in schools reflect the situation in the community. 
We must collectively make COVID safe choices every day to reverse the trend of high daily case counts we are seeing locally. Over 50,000 people in our service area have already received their first dose of the vaccine. And this is certainly encouraging news. While we work to get vaccines into arms, please continue to follow public health measures to prevent the spread of the virus. The spring break came to a close on Friday, April 16, with an important announcement from the province in response to the rising COVID-19 case numbers and the modeling projections that show the situation is on the verge of spiraling out of control. Both the provincial declaration of emergency and the stay at home order have been extended for additional two weeks. The government restricted travel into Ontario from Manitoba and Quebec, with the exception of work, healthcare services, transportation and delivery of goods and services, or exercising Aboriginal or treaty rights. The province closed all non-essential workplaces in the construction sector. This does not affect the construction of our new school on the LaSalle Secondary School site. This project continues with stringent health and safety measures. Police officers and other provincial offenses officers were given the authority to require any individual to provide their home address and, pur and purpose for not being in their residence. This measure was revoked the following day. All outdoor recreational amenities such as golf courses, basketball courts, soccer fields and playgrounds were closed with limited exceptions. Closing playgrounds were also revoked the following day. The pandemic has certainly challenged us to find new ways to maintain value tradition, and that includes special events. On March 11th, approximately 12 classes of students from Rainbow Secondary Schools joined together virtually to talk trades with Paula France. Paula is the head designer for his own company and is best known for his role, his role on HDTV's Home to Win, Custom Built, Decked Out, and Deck Wars. Paul was joined by his daughter, a recent welding graduate, who was inspired to pursue a career in the trades during a dual credit shop class. This event was made possible by the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program, Rainbow District School Board, and Cameron College. A 75th annual Kiwanis Music Festival of, Sub of Sudbury kicked off on March 29th and wrapped up on April the 9th. This year, participants uploaded their performance on videos using YouTube, and live adjudications took place via Zoom. This year, the 51st annual Subway Regional Science Fair went virtual after cancelling last year's fair for the first time since its inception. Whether it's earth sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, or more, I'm amazed at the creativity of the topics and the complexity of the analysis put forward by students. These projects are a testament to student imagination and curiosity, their ability to wonder, observe, question, explore, experience, and evaluate. To participate, students completed their projects and prepared presentation materials that were uploaded to Project Board. And although participants, staff, judges, and families could not watch projects come to life in person, the online platform has allowed the broader community to participate from the comfort of their homes. This year, Rainbow Schools were represented by three students from Llewellyn Park Secondary School. Carrie Yang, grade 12, for her project, Reversal of Bacteria-Driven Colorectal Cancer Cell Growth by Dandelion, Dandelion Root Extracts. And Edward Zong, grade 10, for his project, Autonomous Prevention of Bus Overcrowding and Mass Detection. And Annika Matus, grade 10, for her project, Cleaning Up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a novel solution. The fair wrapped up virtually on Sunday, April, 3, April 18th, when a celebration of all 2021 projects and participants and award winners. Edward, Carrie, and Annika each earned divisional, special, and grand awards. All three students were selected to participate in the virtual Canada-wide science fair next month. We wish them continued success as they showcase their projects among the best young scientists in the country. Congratulations. Rainbow District School Board Student Senate will host a Stand Up for Equity and Inclusion Conference on Thursday, April 29th. Students from all secondary schools will participate in this virtual event. Throughout the day, students will break into Jamboard sessions and hear keynote addresses on a variety of topics such as personal bias, 
body positivity, gender equity, poverty awareness, immigration as well as equity issues with the LGBTQ2 plus and indigenous communities. The day will culminate with the sharing of ideas by schools about ways to bring the information back to their peers to further foster equity and inclusion. I would like to thank the Student Senate under the leadership of Student Trustee Ava LaFrance for their work on this important conference. Another event set to go virtual is the Schools and Community Safety Supported by Community Threat Risk Assessment Protocol presentation with Kevin J. Cameron on Wednesday, June 2nd at 6.30. Kevin Cameron is the Executive Director of the North American Center for Threat Assessment and Trauma Response. He led the crisis response following the 1999 school shooting in Tabor, Alberta, just eight days after the Columbine shoot school shooting. Kevin Cameron developed the Traumatic Event System, known as TES model, and Canada's first comprehensive multidisciplinary violent threat risk assessment training program in concert with the RCMP Behavioral Sciences Unit. The Violence Threat Risk Assessment, sometimes referred to as VITRA Steering, Steering Committee, is hosting the event via Zoom. Parents in Rainbow Schools will be encouraged to participate in this not-to-be-missed presentation. While we continue to, live, uh, to live and learn in the midst of a global pandemic, more great things are happening in Rainbow School. Here's another example. Nethra Rikramussing, a grade 12 student at Lockerbie Composite School who has won national awards for innovative science, science fair projects, will be featured in the Museum of Ingenuity, the J. Armand Babardier Traveling Exhibition set to open in spring of 2022. The exhibition, a showcase of young Canadian inventors between the ages of 13 to 24, celebrates the spark of ingenuity and highlights the creativity driving numerous young Canadians those who have left their mark on history and those paving the way for the future. Neither's project, a novel application to increase wellness using cognitive behavior therapy, was first presented at the 2018 Subway Regional Science Fair to address the prevalence of mental illness in society. A wireless device worn on the wrist detects physiological changes related to depression and anxiety. We are thrilled that Nethra will be showcased among the best and brightest young scientists in the country, in the country across, across Canada. As I come to the end of this update, I cannot stress enough how important it is for our school communities to stay the course and follow public health measures to limit the spread. We must remain vigilant. Screen for COVID-19 as part of your morning routine. Sick, stay at home. And with the stay at home order in place across Ontario, only leave home if it's absolutely necessary, like doing groceries, getting exercise, or attending a medical appointment or essential work. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Follow the arrows and mind the dots. Keep a safe distance. Don't burst your bubble, which is now your household. Limit your social circle. And the guidance now is to limit your social circle to your own household or one other household if you live alone. Come together by staying safely apart. And I will end this evening's update where I began by acknowledging our staff, students and parents and guardians for their ongoing flexibility and adaptability as we respond to COVID-19. We know this has not been an easy journey, but we remain optimistic that as more and more vaccine is administered, the destination is in sight. To our staff, students, and families, thank you for working together to keep everyone safe. We appreciate your continued patience and understanding. And this brings this evening's update to a close. We'd be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Once again, I have to say thank you very much on behalf of the trustees, uh, Director Blazik. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see there's a virtual applause uh, going on and uh, the trustees, uh, I, I know, want to individually. Thank you very much for this update. There's some fantastic news that is being shared on there and um, uh, I, I, I want to just comment briefly and I'm going to ask if there are any questions uh, and I'm going to just 
this is not a question, but it's a comment. The one thing I do know for sure is that many of our staff, many of our staff uh, did not enjoy a spring break. They worked right through it. So, and it was all work that was being done in preparation for future. And, um, and I have to tell you that uh, I know for sure that's that happened. Um, so I, I, I join with you, Director Blazek, in thanking our, our staff for everything they do every day. Any questions for Director Blazek or uh, uh, Trustee Gibson? Thank you, Chair Dewar. Uh, yes, through you to Director Blazek. Um, I was wondering if you had a number or a percentage um, of how many of our staff, uh, and that's at school sites and, and also at the um, Centre for Education, how many of our staff are working from home currently? So I would, uh, I don't know the exact number, but I will tell you the vast majority, and I would suggest it's probably at least 90%. Okay, that, that's what I was looking for, like a rough idea. It's so, a roughly 90%. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with regards to our staffing and planning uh, for next year, you mentioned that we're staffing for a normal school year. Um, unless we receive any further direction from the ministry. Um, and so in your presentation, you indicated that there was there was no information at this time. Is there any indication of when that may come or is there any idea of, of how the timeline might go or it's it's radio silence there? The, the, it, it's a great question. It's one that we ask, uh, that's asked almost every Monday of the minister. And it's one that's asked of every Thursday of the deputy minister when we have our conference calls. Uh, we have been told on numerous occasions that it's uh, coming soon. Okay, thank you. Um, and just a last question regarding the um, the wireless internet uh, pilot out there in Manitowing, Massey, and Mindamoya. Um, what sort of technology uh, do you know is, is the pilot uh, employing? For so at this point, all I can tell you is that there will be towers and the towers will be um, central, or will be located on the school site. I, whether they're on top of the building, beside the building, what the tower looks like, I have no idea. So th those details need to come forward still. Okay, thank you. What, what I can tell you though, is, is they have a 15 kilometer radius in terms of their, their um, uh, connectivity rate. And my understanding is optimum level is 12 kilometers and less. Okay, thank you. Trust. Trustee Cosmerly. Just one quick comment. Uh, my daughter is a psychologist in Ottawa. Uh, she does cognitive behavior therapy, um, as do her peers. I've shared the information with her and her peers about the wonderful project that was done by one of our students. Uh, and they're going to try to take a look at it and see if it might be something that they might be able to use where they work. I want to give a shout out to all of our really incredible students that take part in the science fair. There's so, such wonderful stuff that's out there. Uh, so I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Trustee Cosmerly. Uh, Trustee Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you to Director Um Norm, I know you're aware of this and I know you've been working behind the scenes to try to improve this situation, but my question still comes, particularly if we're all under basically, we're, we're in virtual learning until further notice, why would there be different communiques coming out from the four directors? It, um, it's, it's a great question. Um, some, um, I think some, some, I can't speak for the other directors, but I will tell you that we only provide information based on what's been given to us by Public Health Summary District, and we don't uh, project. All we do is we take their lead. Uh, I think some, some folks, maybe they're taking it at one week at a time or two weeks at a time and given definite dates in preparation. I'm not sure what the rationale is behind that, but we are taking our lead from uh, Public Health. So until further notice, this is our situation. 
supplementary, supplementary comment, if I could, thank you very much. And I know you've been working to try to clarify this, Norm. Uh, it just causes confusion in the, in the communities. And we've got neighbors who are getting different messages who live side by side, kids who share bus routes, French boards telling them they were gonna be back on the 28th and then extending it another date. And ours are saying until further notice. And so amongst families and caregivers, it's causing confusion. So if you could just again, pass that feedback back. I would appreciate it. Thank yes, you. I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I want to just before we move off of this topic and on to tenders and requests, I want to uh, remind everybody of the um, saying that Director Blazik has shared with us our motto you might say at this time, and that is teamwork makes the dream work. So once again, thank you to each of you, as well as to every staff member who is part of making the dream work. Okay, uh, we'll move along to tenders and requests for proposals. Motion that the board award the contract for Manitoulin Secondary School HVAC upgrades and emergency power generator, tender number 2021-11 to Metal Air Mechanical Systems Limited for $895,595. Moved by uh, Trustee Cosmerly, seconded by Trustee Stringer, any questions? Uh, anything you wanted to say? Uh, yes, Trustee Morrison. Through you, Madam Chair, to the Superintendent of Business, Bazinet. Uh, Dennis, is this the kind of work that's going to continue in, in, in spite of the, the um, recent orders from the province on stopping construction? Um, they said that that projects that were funded by the governments would not be stopped. So I would I'm want to assume that these these particular ones will prove this work will proceed. But I thought I better verify that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, all of our projects are not affected. Uh, they are all considered part of the essential. Uh, construction. Therefore, all our projects will continue, including this one. And if I may, I'd just like to take a moment to give a little more of a description on the work that will be performed at Manitoulin. So under the scope of this project, we will be replacing the last of three ventilation units with new units, and that will complete the mechanical ventilation for the entire school. Uh, all units will also be controlled by the updated building automation system. The project does include a backup generator to maintain power during the frequent power outages that tend to occur on the island. With the backup generator, we'll be, we will be able to maintain a functioning water filtration system. Uh, the boilers will continue to work and provide heat in the building, and we will also power some emergency lighting. This project is being funded by the newly announced provincial federal uh, COVID-19 infrastructure funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw your hand up, uh, Trustee Gibson. Thank you, Chair Dewar. Uh, through you to the Superintendent of Business. Um, I'm just wondering, um, the, not necessarily the rationale, but um, like why certain schools are receiving upgrades as opposed to others. And I understand that you gave us a long list of others um, at the strategic planning meeting that Mr. Blazek um, mentioned in his comments. Um, so I apologize for my question not being that precise. I guess what I'm trying to get at is how do we measure that a school has good ventilation? Is there a problem here that we're trying to fix? Are we just upgrading everything that we we like with all the money we have, upgrading as much as possible, or are we isolating specific problems? I'm just trying to get an understanding of like a standard that we might be trying to reach, for example, whether we're measuring CO2. Like, if you could just give a little bit of background of 
of what these upgrades mean, like when they're finished, what does that mean for air quality and, and specifically in the context of COVID? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, in terms of the uh, context of which schools and which projects, uh, uh, there are a number of factors that do come into the equation. Uh, when we are submitting our projects to the ministry of which uh, all of these were submitted, uh, not all got approved. And again, the ministry applies their criteria. Often it's based on the age of the equipment, uh, first and foremost. Uh, some of the other ventilation projects that were listed in previous updates, it reflected schools that had no mechanical ventilation. So they were prioritized from that perspective. So it is a culmination of various factors. And often cases, it also relates to the assessments that have been done over the years by the Ministry of Education. And it uh, uh, outlines uh, the lifespan of certain ventilation equipment. And of course, since the pandemic, ventilation has taken uh, a top priority across all, all the school boards. So uh, it's a blend of all these factors. Uh, in terms of the actual measurements, under the scope of one of the other uh, PPFs that were announced, we are performing some actual ventilation testing at the schools that were outlined in the previous uh, uh, report. And, and once again, it's being measured as a performance to the standard of the construction itself. So it's not, we're not measuring air quality per se because that in itself is a very different matter. And that typically within the context of our own board uh, only comes to the surface if we're having particular concerns in a certain building with indoor air quality. And it's often complaint driven by the occupants. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, gives you a better context of how we uh, tend to get some of these projects uh, listed and then subsequently approved. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you very much. Um, poll vote, Director Blazik. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Honda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried unanimous. Thank you very much. Motion is carried. Um, we have another motion that the board award the contract, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the contract for RLBD public school ventilation and electrical upgrades <clears throat> Excuse me. Tender number 202109 to New Style Construction Company, 1988 Limited, for $969,200. Moved by Trustee Clement, seconded by Trustee St. Jean. And. Uh, are there any questions? Would you like to give us a little bit of information on that one, um, Superintendent Bazinet? Thank you, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, under the scope of this project, we will be upgrading the main switch gear for the school and all of the electrical panels within the schools have, as they have reached the end of their life cycle and it's very difficult to get parts for the repairs. With the electrical upgrade, we will be able to install additional rooftop ventilation units to provide additional ventilation to the school and also, uh, once again, control the ventilation system with our building control systems. Uh, under the scope of this project, it will be uh, funded through our school condition improvement funding allocation, which is the one we receive on an annual basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone ready to call the vote? Poll vote, Director Blazik. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. 
In favor. Trustee Gibson. In favor. Trustee Honda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried unanimous. Motion is carried. Thank you very much. There are no reports or recommendations for board committees. Uh, there's no request for leave of absence. And that brings us to director's remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank Just you, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to, there's a couple of things that you, you might recall that um, uh, we had some challenges with the uh, school year calendar. Um, we had thought we had arrived at a uh, uh, school year calendar earlier in the year, but the ministry then imposed, uh, or at least requested three, three uh, PA days at the beginning of the school year. Uh, so that meant we had to go back to the table and um, reorganize our PA days. So there is uh, some subtleties, some subtle uh, differences. Um, and again, you have to be reminded that we have uh, we have an obligation to uh, at least um, consult with one of our um, collective agreements, EPO, in order to uh, arrive at a, um, um, a request uh, that's based on their collective agreement. And that is, if we have any, we can't, we must have their permission or at least their uh, collaboration in order to have more than one PD day prior to the start of school. Uh, so in this case. Uh, we brought forward that we were originally going to have three PA days, September 1st, September 2nd, September 3rd, as the ministry requested. And um, the um, ETFO uh, had decided that that was not in the, uh, that was against the collective agreement. So we went back to the drawing board and we came up with an alternative. So we have a slightly varied uh, school year calendar, uh, but it is novel in that for, for students, they will not notice any difference, whether you're from, from Rainbow or whether you're from uh, one of the other three boards. So basically the, the biggest change is Rainbow will have two PA days in September, September 1st and September 2nd, and March the 11th. March the 11th originally was going to be a board holiday prior to the March break. But since we had to forego that uh, uh, the third day, and in terms of our discussions with EFO, we made March the 11th the PD day, which didn't impact students whatsoever, and it didn't impact busing, so that was a good thing. So at this point, uh, we share a, um, a common calendar with the other three boards as it relates to students, but it will be slightly different for PA days. So it's uh, suffice to say that and there will be a communication uh, forthcoming, and I know um, our communications officer, uh, Nicole Charette, is working with the other boards, and they're looking at uh, not only the English version, but a French version, so that'll be coming out uh, anytime soon. Okay, so I just wanted to bring you up to date with the, in regards to that. The other thing, and uh, so I just wanted to um, uh, bring forward to, like I did in camera, I just wanted to make this public this afternoon, and so if you'll just bear with me. Uh, so again, tonight I want to inform trustees of my intention to retire. So like the sunrise for uh, every warm and sunny summer morning, there is ultimately a sunset. Have you ever noticed how fast the sun sets? It seems like 1986. That was my first year as an educator up in Attawapiskat. It felt like it was just yesterday. It has been 35 plus years for me and my sunset is soon approaching, signaling the end of what is and was a wonderful experience, a wonderful career. And since 1990, it has been a privilege and an honor to serve all of you and the Rainbow District community as a teacher, principal, SO, and since 2010 as director. So I thank you. My sunset will be complete on August 31st of this year. And by then, my sincere hope is that the effects of the pandemic will be fading and a new day, a new era filled with promise will be before you hopefully maintaining and building on the mantra of reaching minds and touching hearts. And of course, I will do whatever I can to assist the board with the transition to a new director and whatever that entails. Please note, although this is my official notice, there is lots of work to be done. And as I mentioned earlier, we can talk about our history together at another time. And for now, we'll roll up our sleeves and ensure we capture that last bit of sun. Thank you.
thank you very much, Director Blazik. Um, other items, I'd like to call on Trustee Clement as uh, Representative Ops, the Director. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate Norm on his decision. I think I mentioned to him before, there's no life, no life like it in retirement. <laughs> um, coming up on Thursday, we're having our Northern meeting um, at six o'clock. And on Saturday, we're gonna have our director's meeting for, for OPSPA at 8.30 uh, Saturday morning. Um, with our Northern meeting, we'll be mentioning, um, we've sent in our board report and uh, Julie Cosme is putting a uh, mental health piece for, together for me. We'll be sending that in also. Um, I'll also be sure that uh, I'll be mentioning the uh, Student Senate and the uh, NASRA, her, her achievements, and also the Science North achievements. What a, what a great achievement for our board. I remember taking chemistry and I was always hung up on the periodic table. Oh, this is way beyond that. Um, also, I'd just like to mention, I don't know if it has been mentioned, but, but uh, it sounds like the Espinola School, and they're blaming it on COVID, is, and that's another subject, but it won't be ready till September now, so this is really slow. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Trustee Clement. Trustee Cosmerly, did you have? Yeah, as the alternate, there were just a couple of things I wanted to add, if that's all right. Yes, sure. Um, so just a quick up, update on OPSPA's Project Compass Phase 2, the purpose of which is to raise awareness of OPSPA's role and to model and support good governance. Uh, as of April 1st, I've replaced Bob Clement on the Project Compass Steering Committee, and my first meeting will be on May the 12th. As well, I'm sitting on the policy and procedure subcommittee. This group is still in the process of setting the parameters for our review of OPSPA's policies and procedures, and our next meeting is on May the 4th. Just wanna remind people that there is a, a questionnaire that was sent out to all trustees on March 26th to gauge trustees' knowledge and understanding of what the, what OPSPA does and to identify areas of need that areas that need improvement. Uh, to date, there's only been 36 surveys returned to OPSPA, so they're looking for rep replies. Uh, the deadline for completion is April 22nd, so I encourage people to uh, complete the survey if they can take a few minutes, because that's what's going to be guiding the work of the four Compass subcommittees. And that, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, call on student trustee Ava LaFrance, and you got some big stuff happening, Ava. We do. So right now we're just finalizing all the details for our conference. We're just um, like smoothing everything out to make sure um, it runs effectively and everyone will be able to um, get onto the meets and uh, listen to all of our great speakers. Uh, I also just want to let everyone know that if you do want to attend um, the conference, we're just finalizing the agenda right now and like um, activating the link so they're able for um, everyone to click on and go to their proper uh, presentation. So we'll send that out soon to anybody who wants to join us, but that's all I have tonight. So will you, would you be uh, willing to send those links out to the trustees and then those trustees that want to can link in or would you yeah. want us to contact you individually? I'll send, I'll send the agenda to all the trustees and then they can, you'll be able to see at what time certain people are presenting and you can go into those keynotes or breakouts or just join us the whole day, whatever um, you want to do. Sounds like a plan. Thank you very much, Trustee LaFrance. Uh, trustees remarks or questions? Trustee Stringer. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
I have some comments relating to COVID-19 vaccinations for education and child care workers. On April 7th, Minister Lecce responded to significant pressure from OPSPA and many other groups by announcing an increased level of prioritization for vaccination of education sector workers. Specifically, he said all staff working with special needs students and all staff in hotspots in Toronto and Peel would be eligible effective April the 12th. And that was good news. And it's been great to see that rollout start, including to special needs staff here in Rainbow. With that said, more is needed to be done. And some health units have made it a priority to vaccinate all education and child care workers immediately. They have carefully considered the unique essential nature of education as well as the opportunity afforded by the April break and the current remote learning direction from the province. These health units include Niagara, Guelph, Grey Bruce and Halton. None of these are hotspot regions and Grey Bruce, which includes a Blue Water Board of Education from sort of Owen Sound to Goderich and Tobermory is similar in many ways to Sudbury and District Health Unit. It's uh, Important to note that Grey Bruce and Niagara were aiming to have vaccinations for all their education sector staff completed by the end of the April break. Niagara's health unit rationale, and you can look this up on their website and uh, see it, is really about um, early prioritization of education workers is, is very helpful in considering uh, all of this discussion. They noted a number of risk factors in schools, including the risk the risk of exposure to infection since many children experience asymptomatic infections, the risk of transmission within a congregate setting, including on buses and in class, the risk of disruption to in-person learning, which is critical to the mental, behavioral and developmental health of children, and also the risk of long-term effects from COVID-19 in children, including rare but serious cases of inflammatory syndrome which remains unclear and therefore it's very important to vaccinate those who may transmit illness to children. Um, so Niagara noted that school closures disrupt critical school-based services, including the provision of support to parents so they can continue to work. Importantly, they noted that school closures divert health unit resources away from their vaccination rollout to do contact tracing and outbreak management. Case in point, last week, Gray Bruce was busy vaccinating all of their education workers when they had a spike of 73 cases in one day and had to divert personnel from vaccinations to contact tracing. We know that here in Sudbury and district, the situation has been very similar with a large number of school-based outbreaks causing huge pressures on the resources of the health unit and resulting in the movement to remote learning in area schools a number of weeks ago. With education workers in remote learning, we have an opportunity right now to vaccinate them and add an extra layer of protection for students, staff, their families and the community. Our students need to be in school and our custodians, EAs, teachers, ECs, daycare workers, bus drivers and school admin staff need to be able to attend their, to their students' needs without the fear of contracting COVID and taking it home to their families. September 1st is not far off, and in order to have public confidence in our personnel, in other words, staff being fully vaccinated, we must vaccinate every employee by April 30th with a second vaccination by August 31st. So, Chair Dewar, I'm prepared to make a motion this evening to address this. Um, now, the motion would read as follows, and uh, I will... Um, uh, be open to perhaps a change in how it's addressed. That Rainbow District School Board write a letter to public health Sudbury and districts with a CC to the Premier, the Minister of Education, Federations, OPSPA member boards, requesting all education sector workers receive a COVID vaccine on a priority basis. Now, having said that, it, it has been suggested um, that it, we address this letter to the Premier and the Minister of Education and put the pressure there um, as they are the ones controlling vaccine distribution and our, our own uh, local public health unit doesn't have um, the ability to impact that. I'm open to discussion about that with folks and um, I guess I'll leave it there right now. Thank you. Um, sorry, Trustee Morrison. 
I, I, if Trustee Stringer is making that motion, I will second it. And I just wanna speak very briefly to it. I think the reason initially for the suggestion was that that was led our understanding based on discussions that our director has been having with the health unit was that some of the, the allocations of priority in terms of local vaccine rollout was determined by the Sudbury Public Health Unit. So that's why the, the motion actually is talking about a letter going to Sudbury Public Health, but letting the other upper levels of government know it. But whoever gets it, I don't care, I will support it. I think this is just a, a, a concept. We know they are rolling these out on a priority basis and that we already heard from Director Blasek that many of our special ed staff who deal with close physical proximity with some of our students of highest needs are already being vaccinated now. And others, and our staff continue as they meet the age requirements, um, they continue of course to become eligible. But I'm with Trustee Stringer on, them, on this. I think it's really important. And as we see some of the scientific data, of course it evolves as we learn more, we, we evolve. Uh, but I look at Pfizer, for example, has now got some pretty good uh, results from doing vaccines from 13 to 18 year olds. And they are currently <clears throat> running a study from two year olds to 13 year olds. And they actually have as young as six month old babies enrolled. Um, so my hope would be that we have some additional scientific data that is also going to ensure that I'm not going to add this to the motion, but my hope would be that the science leads us that our students will be able to be vaccinated by the fall as well. But right now I'm concerned I'm with Trustee Stringer. I think we need to at least be on record that we think our education sector workers need to be protected. So I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Dubosky. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to respectfully uh, ask the mover and seconder to consider um, where to direct uh, this letter. Reason being is that the Sudbury District Public Health Unit does not have the discretion to uh, unilaterally um, deviate from the uh, ethical framework and the vaccination uh, guidelines. What I think we need to do is to support our local uh, public district Sudbury Health Unit in advocating for uh, the immediate uh, vaccination efforts for education sector worker workers coupled with um, the reduction in the four month wait time uh, for education sector workers specifically. I, I think it's a it's a larger issue um, with Pfizer and um, Moderna vaccines, we, we need to advocate and push for the 21 and 28 day uh, framework as established by the uh, developers of those vaccines. And um, I believe that that's where this uh, advocacy and, um, um, and us championing this initiative for our education workers to, to receive these uh, vaccinations effectively. Uh, right now, um, I, I do sit at uh, several different tables on the vaccination efforts. I do know that our uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health has been advocating. Uh, currently, uh, they, we are, they are advocate, or, uh, sorry, vaccinating uh, those special education workers as noted um, and anticipate uh, mid-May to start the rest. But I think what we need to do is really champion the effort on ensuring that the uh, the time in between vaccinations do not wait the four months, which would, you know, of course, jeopardize uh, the new school year and, and education sector workers uh, not being vaccinated as such. Um, and I think, uh, I, I strongly feel that if we align ourselves with the Sudbury District Public Health Unit, we're not putting unnecessary uh, pressure on them to, to make these deviations from eth ethical frameworks, which, which would likely get them into hot water uh, from a political standpoint with uh, Indigenous communities not yet fully vaccinated in our health unit. Um, the issues that Niagara and Gray Bruce did face as part of their deviations is that uh, there, there was significant backlash and uh, concerns in relation to the ethical prioritization framework. And I would hate to see for uh, Sudbury District Public Health Unit triaging from those who have a priority, seniors, underlying health issues, those who are unable to uh, you know, get into a, a central region such as Sudbury on Manitoulin Island, for example, the West End hasn't even been touched yet. And so, um, I wouldn't want to put public health Sudbury in a in a in an awkward position to triage and take away those who already take away from those who are already listed to, you know, put the others at a 
um, more of a priority. While I do fully support the prior the prioritization of everyone in our unit uh, equally, um, we need to be mindful of the precarious positions we may um, not think of that we're, we're, we're putting them in. But I, I would support a collaborative effort and a collab collaborative advocacy strategy uh, to the to the office of the premier to um, the Ministry of Health to uh, the Ministry of Education, as well as uh, copying the opposition parties and really uh, pushing forward with the uh, the advocacy for, of course, once there's a, a better supply of vaccines, the the immediate um, vaccination of those who are not yet counted in the age population or or other factors, but also to ensure that the uh, time from vaccination is reduced from the four month wait to the 21 and 28 day respectively, dependent on, uh, of course, any other additional approved vaccinations. And I think that that's the larger piece. And if we can get that um, that collaborative effort uh, with our chief medical officer of health, perhaps other public health units will, will come on board to really uh, push for that uh, enhancement to the uh, ethical framework of the vaccination distribution. So I think um, Rainbow District School Board uh, can champion this and really can uh, really make a, a change um, with respect to vaccines for for our for Manitoulin Island and our educations because uh, Manitoulin Secondary School fell within the borders of Chigang First Nation. We did include all educators um, at Manitoulin Secondary School in our vaccine rollout plan in the effort to uh, mass vaccination our population and so. Um, I know Director Blasic has been wanting to share that news and I've been asking him to, to kind of wait as the, the vaccines uh, roll out, but we did uh, make that offer as our community to to uh, uh, vaccinate those who we deem as essential workers within the borders of our First Nation community. And so um, I think there's other, other ways to also do the same. Um, and I think uh, uh, when we when we look at those pieces and those relationships and those collaborations, uh, I think it's best to be in alignment um, rather than to lobby an entity um, that may not have that ability, but really lobby um, those individuals at, at the different tables. And I'd also be happy to take um, any letter uh, any letter made by Rainbow District School Board uh, to any of these entities and and uh, push them through at different tables. I also sit at in a in a in a strengthened advocacy effort for educators um, as a whole. So I'll leave my comments there. Me much. Thank you very much. So, Margaret, or I'm going to ask you if you would, if you want to the 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 only change I, I guess that you would need is to is right after it says write a letter to and yeah. if you would like to change that part you want the premier and the minister of education and then copy public health Sudbury and districts federations OBSPA board members and offices and party and the ministry of health, and the ministry of health. And yeah I'm, I'm i'm get i'm i'm reading them out so, um, um, I, I, and, and it's always easy. Sorry, I am interrupting. I'm sorry. It's always very easy to add uh, copies, uh, you know, to whoever. But we we absolutely have to decide as part of the motion who the who the letter is going to go to. And I, I am open to um, changing that to be that the write a letter to the premier or the minister and the minister of education with a copy to the ones we've mentioned. Um, I think a lot of this stemmed from the the scientific community and uh, that have come forward and said that the government needs to be looking at essential workers. Until we get our essential workers vaccinated, we're going to continue to not be able to. Um, keep our schools open, for example. We get back to school, but now our essential workers, our, our teachers that aren't vaccinated are off sick because of the new screening. They could be off with one, um, one symptom and our schools aren't able to stay open. So it's kind of a vicious circle that we need to break that. 
and I think that the scientific community they were speaking as well about education workers, but they were also speaking about um, you know uh, places like Amazon where they needed mass vaccination so that we're breaking that cycle again. I hear in the news today uh, there's been some new developments in some of that. Um, so that's where my thought was coming from that we need to address this. Um, so we break that cycle, we get our kids back to school. If, if the strength comes from um, addressing it to the Premier and the Minister of Education, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, does everyone else um, support that? Or I, I well, let's, let's have some more, there's some more discussion that's out there. And I did recognize um, Trustee Gibson and then Trustee Morrison. Thank you, Chair Dewar. I, I just wanted to bring up a point of order. Is the motion on the floor? Has it been read and seconded? So, yes, we have. So is someone putting forth an amendment? Or, like, I just feel like we're having a discussion. We need to put forward an amendment. The, 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 I'm, wrong. I'm confused. Okay, I have, that's why I went back to the mover, Margaret Stringer. And the second um, and the seconder, and Margaret has said she's quite willing to see the change to <coughs> Premier and Minister of Education. Excuse me, Madam Chair. Yes. So do we need to uh, currently um, um, uh, vote on that now and then change it. I, I would like to have no, 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 no. There's no voting yet. None okay. until we have uh, until we have our discussion so over. And with, yeah. and have, um, currently, the motion states, as as I uh, had sent in advance to folks, um, that it would be to the public health and suburban districts, and I am open to amending that. So I'll leave that with you. That's, that's why I went to you, yeah, Trustee Morrison. Chair, I've just been trying to be recognized as the seconder um, that I'm quite comfortable. Yes. We're considering Trustee Gibson. This is a friendly amendment. So I have no problem as a seconder with changing the wording before it gets to the vote because this is not a significant change in the intent of the motion. All we were really talking about is who the letter is being addressed to. And I, I'm willing, I wanted to support a motion that put us on record that's saying we're advocating for our educational workers. That's all. Thank you. And so I support the amendment as read by Trustee Stringer and yourself. Thank you. We can reread that. Okay. Margaret, do you mind if I read that over again? And That's fine. did you want it? Well, let's read it and you tell me if, if we have the right motion. That the Rainbow District School Board write a letter to the Premier and the Minister of Education, copies to uh, public health Sudbury and districts, um, federations, OBSPA member boards, the Ministry of Health and to the oppos and to opposition parties requesting all education sector workers receive a COVID vaccine on a priority basis. Moved by Trustee Stringer, seconded by Trustee Morrison. Further discussion on the motion. Ready for the question? Trustee Gibson. Thank you, Chair Dewar. Um, I will not be supporting this motion. Um, and it's not that I don't support vaccination for education workers, uh, I do. However, um, we've heard many times tonight that, that we take the lead from public health. Um, and I'm not aware, uh, we had a message from Dr. Penny Sutcliffe tonight. I did not hear from her uh, that she required us to advocate on her behalf. This letter started out, I guess, going to a different destination and now you're looking at the Premier and the Minister of Education. I might suggest that perhaps the Minister of Health would be the person if, if you really want to try and get the vaccination guidelines changed. Um, but I'll keep my comments brief and say that I really think that the last thing the Ontario vaccination program needs is more political input. 
the problem, as I see it, is, is all the political posturing. Um, I have complete faith in Dr Sutcliffe that if this was something that was a priority, she would communicate that to our director who would communicate it to us. What I heard from the director earlier on was that they were having those discussions and they were moving forward as best they could. So I have no doubt that the minute that it is feasible for our education workers to get those vaccines, they will. The other issues that were brought up by Trustee DeBasque are all very valid points, the timing in between the vaccines, that sort of thing. But I'm just not really sure if that, as a school board, if, if that's our mandate. It's certainly not my area of expertise. I understand that Trustee DeBasque sits on those tables and has access to much more information, but perhaps those tables are the people that need to be, or the committees need to be writing letters and advocating because they have all the information in front of them. And frankly, I just don't, and I, I don't see the necessity of putting my opinion in when it's, it's an uneducated opinion on this matter. Having said that, I really hope that we can get everyone vaccinated as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Stringer. Um, respectfully, trustee to Trustee Gibson. Um, um, Madam Chair, uh, I do feel it is our mandate. I know that when the province made the decision um, to, from a lot of pressure from OPSPA, our association, to ensure that special education teachers were vaccinated, then the onus was put back to directors and school boards to talk to their public health units and have that in place. So maybe, maybe um, I have a question that could be posed to the director of education around, um, you know, how, how how is that process taking place? Is this something that um, that uh, could be functional and and therefore worthwhile? Director Blazik, are you available? I sure am. So the uh, the answer to that is uh, as I've uh, reiterated, I think in the past that we do meet with public health uh, weekly. And we do have conversations with them. Sometimes they're ad hoc during the week, but every Friday morning at eight o'clock, we do have a meeting with with uh, Penny and the four directors and and her subordinates. Now she's not always there, but certainly the messaging that we we do present to her is that there is a strong advocacy for our folks to be uh, vaccinated as soon as possible. Thank you, Director Blasi. Thank you very much, Direct, uh, Trustee Cosmerly. Sorry, just to add my voice to this, I think what we are doing is adding our voice to Dr. Sutcliffe's to petition the, the ministry and the premier to ensure that our education workers are, are all treated as priorities and it's not just based on age, uh, that they are all being seen as a priority. So I don't think we're working against the health unit, we're working to support them. That's my, my take on it and I will support the motion. Thank you very much. Director Blazik, uh, poll vote. Okay. Trustee Clement. In favor. Trustee Dabowski. In favor. Trustee Dewar. In favor. Trustee Gibson. Opposed. Trustee Honda. In favor. Trustee Cosmerly. In favor. Trustee Morrison. In favor. Trustee St. Jean. In favor. Trustee Stringer. In favor. Student Trustee LaFrance. In favor. Carried. Motion is carried. Further remarks or questions under trustees' remarks and questions? Uh, Trustee Morrison. I promise I will keep this very brief, Madam Chair. Uh, this is, I just wanted, just because we're just talking about another letter going out and it's COVID related, can I just give my compliments on the quality of that last letter that went out on virtual and remote learning? To me, that was a, an exceptionally good, well-written letter. I would like to use that. I'm glad we shared it with the world. I'm very proud to be in any way associated with that letter. So good job. Thank you. That's, thank you very much to our communications officer who, um, who did the major work on that. That's Nicole Charette, not just our communications officer, Nicole Charette. 
Thank you very much. And uh, Trustee Cosmerly. Sorry, on another, I had something else I wanted to discuss. Um, I just wanna say how saddened I am about what is happening at Laurentian University. Uh, Laurentian is one of our, our partners in education. Uh, I'm a Laurentian alumnus. I graduated with an honors BSW in 1977. I sat on the student council representing social work for two years. My daughter attended, attended Laurentian where she achieved her bachelor's degree and her master's degree in psychology. I have a number of relatives and friends who have all attended uh, English and French programming at Laurentian University. And currently I have two grandchildren attending and one who is graduating from high school this year, who has been accepted uh, at Laurentian for this fall and who is now unsure if he wants to go. It's always given me great pride to see how Laurentian University has grown to become a truly unique Northern institution, offering French, English, and First Nations programming, and that it has been the university of choice for so many within our community, as well as outside of the Sudbury area. So I have found the news that has been coming out of Laurentian University over the past few months, and especially in the past week and a half, especially distressing. Like many others, I have wondered why the obviously serious financial problems Laurentian is facing were not identified and addressed long before now, before they became a crisis for the university, for the faculty and staff, its students, and for our community, because what is happening at Laurentian has an impact on all of us. I am concerned for our Rainbow High School graduates who are looking at what is going on at Laurentian with trepidation and with confusion. But though things look extremely bleak right now, I nevertheless am confident that we will all weather this storm. And I sincerely hope that Laurentian comes out of it stronger with enhanced governance and accountability and with a plan to reposition itself as a top Northern University and gain back the credibility it has lost. Until then, I wish all of those who are impacted by the changes that are occurring the very best as they determine their own next steps. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Thank you very much. <coughs> Extremely well put. Um, Trustee Clement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Also, my uh, I'd like to just say a few words, not as eloquent as Judy here, but uh, I had two of my three, uh, three kids that go to Laurentian University. And uh, for me as a senior, all it took was a, I took a, I wrote a letter to Laurentian University and I got into Laurentian University and I'm working on my political science and uh, indigenous studies. Um, Laurentian University is not just a university in a, in a Northern Ontario, it's, a com it's for the community. We lose university, the university, we lose so much more. People come to the city because it's a great university. They have so much to offer there. They're so open. I remember uh, my daughter when she first went to university um, there, um, I went and interviewed the, the Dean of Nursing and she laughed because she says, I usually do the interviewing. I said, why should she come here? And I'll never forget her words where she said, if you come to Laurentian and you get a degree in Laurentian, it opens all the doors for her. And it has for her, I mean, you know my daughter, she's a nurse practitioner in Sudbury and, and she's done so much for the community. Um, and I guess today in, the, in today's news, I guess that they're starting to leave the ship. Steve Pagan, who is the chancellor of elementary university, he's leaving. Well, they're a little late. And just a comment I'd like to have, and just like what Ludry was saying about the finances. They have a board also. Let's just look at it as our board. If we ran our board the way Laurentian University ran their board, how long would it be before the government stepped all over us as they did not that long ago in Ottawa where they refused to balance the books and they took over? So I'm just saying, uh, this should have happened a long time ago. Why they didn't see this? And, and uh, we don't have all the information, but no heads rolled. 
just staff and students are being hurt. I don't get this at all. So hopefully we're in the future, this will help to rebuild the Wrench University because it is a great university. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, it's, it, we, we may be at some point in time could at least make a positive statement. It's not up to us to try to figure out what went wrong. It's none of our, our, you know, as as a board. I know it's it has nothing to do with us. But I will say, you know, we we need to at least recognize the fact that Laurentian University is part and parcel of our educational community, and. Um, it's part of our broader community. So I, I thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, oh, sorry, Trustee Dubosky. Sure, I'd just like to add my comments as well uh, to this conversation. Um, Laurentian University is one of the largest universities in Northeastern Ontario and has had a, a strong relationship, I would say, with uh, First Nations um, and indigenous peoples within within the uh, the larger area, and we find that uh, you know with with the situation and challenges happening, um, it's going to create a uh, a further inequity in access to education for indigenous students. Um, our students, whether they're living on reserve or living in in a, in a larger uh, area or city such as Greater Sudbury, Espanola, and surrounding. Um, areas access to education is difficult at best um, and and with the uh, inequities and, and social inequities uh, uh, plaguing uh, First Nations individuals um, the the situation happening at Laurentian University uh, further uh, further further divides that again and so um, many of our families and I think most people from the north would would not be able to uh, number one, survive in a in a larger area like Toronto with the high rental rates, um, lack of affordable housing, and all all of those other pieces um, to attend uh, universities down there. And I think that um, I feel that, uh, and and I I totally agree with everybody's comments so far and the chair's comments as well. Um, I I feel that it would be beneficial that uh, Rainbow District School Board does issue. Uh, some type of statement um, to 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 share our voice uh, as part of that uh, larger educational community, and perhaps uh, have the director can have those conversations with um, our secondary school uh, professionals, seeing how many of our students uh, from the board, um, you know, choose to attend uh, Laurentian. Um, Laurentian has uh, created many. Uh, uh, help or not create, but I would say help uh, support the educational journeys of, of many of our professionals uh, in our area and within our catchment area and, and in the north. And I, I feel that, um, you know, this is a drastic blow to, you know, opportunities for, for our all people of the north um, to have that access to education. And so I, I would support a uh, statement made uh, by the school board. Um, in terms and that in a positive statement as the chair has has raised to to recognize that Laurentian University um, does serve a serve a place in the the educational community and it does provide a, a needed educational service to those individuals who are um, either in, in remote communities or or have a lack of uh, uh, proximity in, in terms of that higher education so um, uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, chairperson's remarks. I have absolutely no remarks this evening and we're gonna just, I'm just going to move right along. Uh, reports from officials and staff, please take a quick look at your backup, which is the Special Education Advisory Committee minutes. Um, in the non-staff communications, I wanted to also mention just, that, although um, Director Blazik has already mentioned, that the, the letter to Minister Lecce regarding the government's proposal to expand online and remote learning 
It was sent on April the 9th. It wasn't shared with other boards until April 13th. However, it was shared with other boards on April 13th. So, um, and uh, we, I must, I must um, suggest, I would like to suggest that uh, perhaps when we send a letter out like that, we, even though we're sending it to all of the trustees, maybe it should be attached to to the the minutes the way we used to attach our our letters to the minutes so that it's on site it's on uh, the web uh yeah so i i'm going to suggest that we do that um future meetings please um take a good look there's our student senate stand up for equity conference and uh that's on april 29th there are a good number of of committees coming up to quote director blazik there's lots of work to be done and we're prepared to do it so i thank each of you for everything you do every day motion that we do now adjourn moved by trustee morrison seconded by trustee clement thank you very much good night